okay hello students uh, we take up one more example to be solved with the help of uh, energy balance uh, before we actually start with this uh, example uh, it should be appreciated that in uh, most of the cases energy balance happens to be a easier method which can be used for finding the uh, differential equations governing the motion the present equation the present example is just going to illustrate this particular thing so let me just uh, bring the example on display So we uh, have the figure for the problem on display. Uh, it consists, the problem consists of a the problem consists of a disc, a circular disc, which has a point mass m located at a distance b from the uh, axis, uh, the entire axis as is clear from the figure is inclined at an angle alpha with respect to the horizontal of course and uh, the axis is uh, supported at two bearings at the ends. We have bearings at uh, both the ends about which the entire system can oscillate. So this is the problem and we will try to do this thing with respect to the energy balance. And since we are dealing with the uh, case of uh, angular oscillation, uh, I have specified the coordinate frame also and the positive direction of the coordinate system has uh, also been indicated in the figure. So as I have already told you that first of all, you should try to find out the number of degrees of freedom. It happens to be one in this particular case, it is angular also. Therefore, we are going to require only one differential equation as the governing equation. And then we are going to use the energy balance. And uh, the last point of interest happens to be the uh, equilibrium configuration which uh, in most of the cases can be found simply by um, simply by inspecting the problem in this case also the system is going to be in equilibrium when the mass m is at the lowest position same thing which we had uh, in the case of a, a simple pendulum the entire pendulum is going to be in equilibrium when the bob is located at the lowest position. So this is the, uh, you can always, you can almost see that uh, the lowest position itself has been demonstrated, uh, indicated in the figure. So with respect to this particular lowest position, the mass is going to oscillate in, in a angular fashion. Also note that the oscillations of the mass are going to be in the plane of the disk. Uh, the oscillations are not in a vertical plane, but the oscillations of the mass are in fact in the plane of the disk which is inclined. Uh, now coming to the actual solution part. Uh, the figure on the left that is uh, this particular figure I am talking about uh, is what is going to be seen when you look at the disk uh, along the axis of oscillation. Okay, that is the along the shaft. This is what the entire figure is going to look like. So we have a uh, point O along which the oscillations are, about which the oscillations are taking place. Then we have a point A which happens to be the lowest position of the mass and uh, this is obviously at a distance of B from the excess of uh, oscillations. 
and when we move the disk uh, by an angle theta from the uh, position of a uh, static equilibrium, the point mass is going to be located at a uh, location given by a dash. Obviously, the point mass traces a uh, arc which is of uh, radius b. So, this is what is going to, this is what can be imagined when you are looking at the entire disk from the direction of the axis of the shaft itself. And uh, I have just in the figure on the right, I have just enlarged uh, this particular view itself because uh, I need to find the height uh, which is going to be known once you find the distance from A to B. Uh, obviously, this can be found very easily, but you should appreciate that the distance AB in fact is not a vertical distance, okay. It is not oriented vertically, but it is lying in the plane of the disk itself, okay. It is lying in the plane of the disk itself. Nevertheless, I can find the distance AB by simple geometrical manipulations. Uh, I can find the distance OB first and then I can uh, actually uh, subtract the distance OB with respect to B to find the distance AB. Okay. So, this is how distance AB is going to be found. And also this particular line is important. It might be a bit confusing also, but uh, if you can imagine it, you will realize that the line AB is on the surface of the disk itself. Now, once the distance OB has been found, we move on to the next slide that is on display now. So, this is important now. What we are, what we have on display is the entire view from the front, okay. Earlier, in the earlier figure, we were looking at this particular uh, problem from the, uh, along the direction of the axis, okay. So, we saw a disk which was present at this location. Of course, it appeared as a circular disk, but now what we are doing is that we are, we have shifted the direction from which we are looking at the problem. We are simply looking at it from the front and uh, in which case the disk is going to appear as a line as, as have been indicated over here. In fact, the line is going to be uh, of uh, this much dimension, okay. This is the disk itself, which is going to appear as a line. Of course, the, as far as the length of the uh, line is concerned, it is going to be twice of uh, B, if you assume that the radius of the disk itself is B. And of course, at point A, we have the mass, uh, located at the position of a static equilibrium and this point B is going to be the location of the mass which has been perturbed from the position of a static equilibrium and it has been projected also, okay. It has been projected on the line joining the point O which is the axis and this particular point A, it has been projected. If this is not clear, if this particular projection is not clear, 
we can refer back to the previous figure. So, this is what is has been done over here. We had the mass at this particular position A. Now, please remember that this particular figure is what you are looking, what you see when you are looking along the uh, direction of the um, axis, along the direction of the axis. So, this is uh, point A is the initial mass, it moves to point A dash over here and then we project A dash on to this particular line which is what is obtained by joining the axis of oscillation with respect to point A. So, we are projecting uh, this point A dash on this line uh, OB, OA and this is as a result we get point B over here. This is what is going to be apparent when you look from the direction along the axis of the shaft. And uh, in the next slide, we have simply, uh, we are simply looking at the entire thing, but we are looking from the, uh, along the direction which is perpendicular to the um, shaft. So, as a result, we see the entire disk as a simple line and then I see the initial position which is over here and then I see the projected position over here, okay. But obviously, both these points A and B, they are on the surface of the uh, disk itself. And then I need to find the height for which I carry out a simple geometrical uh, construction. The height which I am not talking about happens to be the vertical height of course, which is going to be given by this distance over here, okay. And for finding this particular distance, uh, which is represented as a dash, a double dash, b double dash, represented as h. I simply take the projections of OA, uh, that is with respect to cos alpha, because I have the angle alpha involved over here, and the projection of OB along with the help of the same angle. And then I substitute OB and uh, the values of uh, OA and OB, okay. OA basically is B and as far as OB is concerned, well, uh, this has been found in the previous slide. It is in fact given by B cos theta and then I have this angle cos of alpha appearing in the equation. So, once the height has been found, please note that uh, in all the cases of oscillations, what basically is the approach is that you simply find a equation which uh, relates the coordinate system which is theta in this particular case to the height. You basically find a relationship between these two and once this particular relationship has been found, we move on to find the uh, energies involved in the system. So, I have a term of kinetic energy given by half j theta dot square which represents uh, the kinetic energy of course and then the term given by potential energy which is mg into h, h in fact has uh, just been derived in the in the uh, above expression. We simply substitute over here obviously some portion has been taken out as a common quantity and uh, then uh, obviously when the kinetic energy and the potential energy, they are summed up, 
uh, I will get the total energy of the system which is equal to some constant quantity. It is not zero. And then the last step is to differentiate this thing with respect to time t over here, which gives me uh, the end equation after some terms have been cancelled out. And uh, obviously, this particular assumption that theta tends to zero, uh, so sine theta tends to theta, that also comes into picture giving me the natural frequency of vibration to be uh, as has been written in the uh, in the display. Uh, as far as the value of j is concerned, it is m b square because we have a point mass m located at a distance of b from the uh, axis of oscillation. So, we have uh, m b square over here and once you substitute this particular expression, what you get is something over here, g cos alpha by b, which basically means that the uh, oscillation happens to be the uh, function of uh, inclination, okay. It happens to be a function of the natural frequency happens to be a function of inclination. Uh, but uh, you should always try to think, uh, think about the results which you are getting from the logical point also, okay. You should always try to think, you should always try to analyze these results from the logical point of course. Uh, of course, this is one of the points from where we teachers evaluate the answer sheets. Uh, we always tend to look at the solution from the logical thing. And the logic says, uh, one of the logic which can be applied over here is that supposing this alpha is zero. Uh, for which case, if alpha is zero, then obviously it would mean that the entire system is horizontally placed. It has a disk at the center and it is rotating in the angular manner. Of course, there are going to be a couple of bearings which are going to be involved. But this is how the system is going to look like. And in this particular case, uh, it means that if I substitute the value of alpha to be zero, uh, the entire natural frequency which has been obtained for this case should reduce down to the natural frequency for this case. Uh, that is the case of the horizontal axis. So let's see what actually happens over here. Uh, if alpha is uh, zero, cos alpha is going to be one, I'm going to be left with only g by b and of course there is a under root sign involved outside. So as a result, uh, this is what I am going to get, which obviously is the same thing which has been obtained for the uh, case of uh, the simple pendulum. Of course, every oscillating system can be assumed to behave almost like a simple pendulum. So, I always tend to analyze these uh, oscillating systems, uh, systems which have angular oscillation with respect to simple pendulum. That, uh, that correlation tends to simplify uh, problems to a great extent, okay. The geometry might be complex as what is uh, evident over here. The entire geometry might be very complex. Uh, and uh, you might think that uh, how I'm going to analyze these things. But uh, when you actually go on to the depth of it, there is going to be a point when you are going to realize that this is nothing but a simple pendulum. Just the appearance happens to be uh, somewhat distorted. So this is where we uh, end up the session for today. Of course, if there are any queries, kindly let me know and uh, please do think about solving this particular problem from the, uh, using the approach of force balance also, okay, that uh, we are not dealing with at the present time being, but kindly try to solve this entire problem 
using the force balance approach also. That is really going to give you a uh, insight about the uh, complexities or uh, basically you are going to have an idea about the ease with ease the energy method is going to offer compared to the force balance. Obviously, if you can do the force balance approach, obviously once you know it, it is very easy to do it. Okay. All the things which you already know, they are they are easy. But as far as things are not known, you start from the basis and then they uh, might turn out to be complex. Okay, this is how you compare two methods. Try to do this method with respect to the force balance approach also. Okay, then this is where we actually stop. Thank you.